Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Irina, and I'm the event planner for the Redmond Reactor Space. Before we get started, I have a few things to go over. Please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We seek to provide respectful environment for both our audience as well as our presenters. We encourage engagement in the chat, but please be mindful of your commentary, remain professional and on topic. Useful links will also be shared in the chat. This session is recorded and will be available on demand in 24 to 48 hours on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. Which brings us to today's session. The session will run approximately one hour with questions throughout, and I'll now turn it over to our speaker for introductions. Awesome. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hello, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this second project for IoT for Beginners. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And I must apologize. I've got a little bit of a cough this morning. So I do apologize if I keep coughing throughout this. Uh, so welcome. I'm Jim Bennett. I'm a regional cloud advocate at Microsoft. All over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett. Um, oh, and Merrick says hello. Hey, Merrick. Merrick, glad to have you with us. Um, so yeah, I'm all over the internet, Jim Bob Bennett. Please, please, please feel free to connect. If you've got any questions about anything we cover in this four-part series, please, please get in touch. But this series is all about IoT for beginners. Now, you may have joined my streams before. In the past, we have worked through some of the, the, the early projects on IoT for beginners. This series is all about working through the second project, all focusing on digital agriculture. Um, Carlos says, hi, thanks. Hey, Carlos, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Um, I will say, I will, will say this, this can be an entire conversation. So although I'm here to teach you all about the Internet of Things, this is a conversation. So please, please, please ask your questions in the chat. I'm here to help you. Got any questions, comments, please just dive into the chat, ask away. Uh, and obviously, I'll, I'll be asking you a few questions as well as we go throughout. So you know, this is your chance to kind of get involved as well. So what is IoT for Beginners? I keep referring to IoT for Beginners. What is it? So IoT for Beginners, if you head to aka.ms slash IoT dash beginners, um, and we'll get that link put in, the, ch in the, the chat for you. If you head there, you'll be taken to this, IoT for Beginners, a curriculum. So this is our 12-week, 24-lesson curriculum all about IOT, starting with the fundamentals. It's kind of originally designed around a 12-week university semester, but it's here for you to learn about the Internet of Things. It's completely free. It's completely open source. It's MIT licensed, so you can take this and use it for your learning. You can use it in a classroom. You can slice it and dice it and use it in your workplace. However you want to use it, this content is here to help you. And we, we do everything on a journey from farm to table. So there's four lessons that kind of just get you started. And this is what we worked through in a previous series of, of this, where you get going with a nightlight kind of connected to the internet. Then we focus on digital agriculture, which is what we're talking about in this series. Then we look at logistics with data visualization. We look at manufacturing, retail, and consumer IoT devices. And everything is hands-on all the way. So you get to build the projects that you learn about. So we teach the concepts with hands-on projects to get you started. And so it's all here. We've got a lot of great content here. If I just pick up, let's pick a, a lesson, for example, the very first lesson, uh, first project, four lessons. We've got some videos to help you. We've got you know, all the pictures, quizzes, questions all the way through to kind of uh, just make sure that you're absorbing the knowledge. We've got pro information you need. We've got projects and then hands-on with actual hardware. So um, IT for Beginners is kind of here for you to learn IoT. Um, Raman asks, is it related to AWS, IoT, or Azure? Now, as you may know, this is the Microsoft Reactor. <laughs> so I know the answer is probably a little bit here and there, but yes, this focuses on Azure. So yeah, we are Microsoft. We kind of generally don't teach people how to use our competitors' products. Um, so this is all related to Azure, Azure IoT. When we did the first project in the previous videos, we didn't actually look at an, uh, an, any cloud-based services. We just looked at MQTT to communicate. Uh, this time around, we are actually going to be looking at a cloud service, kind of scale up from what we did before about MQTT. So yeah, this is the, the roadmap of the entire RT for Beginners. We've got some of these lovely sketch notes all the way through to kind of keep you going. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. Um, in fact, ah, that's the wrong picture. Sorry, I thought that that, that is the wrong picture. I uh, sorry, been a bit lax with my slide deck. Uh, Romance is okay, no issue. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, we only teach Azure here, so not AWS. Um, so I keep, I keep referring to the previous series that we've run. So if you go to aka.ms slash IoT beginners videos, you'll get one of the times we've run this before. We've actually run this a couple of times, but this we ran just over a year ago, and I went through the first four lessons in depth. And we had one hour going through the lesson. This was using... Um, using Arduino hardware. And then we did one hour of office hours where it's questions and then showing how to do a thing with Raspberry Pi hardware. So you kind of got multiple hardware options throughout here, which we'll talk about in a second. But we've got this kind of eight videos here that go through the first project and then have office hours where we just are talked about it. I answered the whole of questions. So if you want to catch up with everything so far, check out these videos and these will get you going. Now, IoT, the T in IoT stands for things. It involves hardware. We, we need something. We need a thing that we are going to connect. IoT, Internet of Things. We need things to connect to the Internet. And when we built IoT for Beginners, we worked with our good friends at Seed Studios to put together hardware kits for you. So if you go to aka.ms slash IoT Beginners Kits, what you will get is Seed Studio. So our IoT hardware partner, they have kits available. So you can actually buy one of two choices of kits. You can either buy a Wii terminal based kit, which is Arduino based, which uses, oh, where is, where's one of them? Not one here somewhere. Uses this, the Wii terminal, uh, which is Arduino based board with screen and connectors. You can either use that or you can use a Raspberry Pi, depending on your preferred choice of, of hardware. And they all of them use Grove sensors. So Grove is a kind of a plug and play sensor set up. So you literally just connect sensors with standard cables um, and they provide all the libraries for that. We'll dig, be digging into that a little bit with one of the sensors today. But Seed have made these kits available for you to buy the hardware. Now you don't have to buy any hardware. Everything you do in this entire course can also be done using a virtual hardware simulator. So we've built a special simulator where you literally just deploy a web app and in the web app you can say, I want my temperature sensor to give this value well, and you can see lights coming on and everything like that. So you've got a virtual hardware simulator, which means you don't need to buy any hardware. You need to do absolutely everything for free. All you need to do is just have a computer to run this. And Fuel Snable, hey, Fuel Snable. We were literally just talking about you before uh, before the show. Great to have you back. Um, Fuel Snable says, I thought the T stands for security. So this is a, related to an old joke that the S in IoT stands for security. So obviously there is no S in IoT um, because IoT has been a bit insecure in the past. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we won't be touching on security today, but um, you'll so often see that as the joke because there's been a lot of IoT security issues. So today we're working through digital agriculture and we're not doing the entire digital agriculture project that comes as part of IT for Beginners. The digital agriculture project is six lessons uh, we're, we're only doing a four week series here. So we're only doing four of these. So we're not doing the first one around using temperature sensors to do uh, plant growth prediction. Instead, we're focusing on four lessons where we look at soil moisture, automated watering, and then how you get your IoT service running in the cloud. Um, the sixth lesson is how to keep your plants secure. We're not going to be looking at security in this particular one. So Fuels and Abel can laugh at us about the lack of security. Uh, but yeah, we're not going to be diving into plant security, well, not plant, uh, IoT security uh, in this particular series. We're only, we're only running four episodes. So we're just focusing on the soil moisture sensors and getting the data managed by the cloud. <laughs> Now, so this is all about the Internet of Things. And so it's not just about this is how you connect a device to Azure IoT Hub, for example. We are focusing on a lot of the core concepts of the Internet of Things that you need to know as an IoT engineer. So we're going to, be to look at soil moisture today because digital agriculture is an absolutely huge use case for the Internet of Things. And then we're going to dive a little bit into how sensors communicate with IoT devices. Yes, we have a soil moisture sensor, but how does that actually communicate with our device? So we're going to dive into a number of ways that IoT hardware can communicate with IoT devices. Um, and then we're going to talk about sensor calibration. If you've come to any of my streams before, you know I talk about how data scientists, domain experts, and AI engineers are your friends. This is true here. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. So the idea behind this is to kind of give you all the knowledge you need 
to kind of get started thinking about large IoT applications and understanding all the aspects of those applications. Now, digital agriculture is absolutely huge. The developed world uses it for everything. So whether it's soil moisture sensors, whether it's monitoring pollution in water runoff, whether it's tracking weather, even using drones to do flyovers of farms to monitor crop quality, digital agriculture is enormous. And it's growing in the developing world as well, because there's a lot of techniques you can use that are very low priced. And so just things like basic soil moisture sensing isn't that expensive. Yeah, compared to like drones, it's not that expensive. And so these, this is a hugely growing area. And because we've got a massively growing population and we, we need to feed that population, we need to make sure we can optimize how we grow food. And IoT really helps here. Oh, Rich Princess is back. Says, hi, awesome teacher. Rich Princess, welcome, welcome back. Again, we're talking about you as well, actually. Um, so Rich Princess has uh, kindly joined a number of my streams, and I had the, the privilege of meeting them in person at an event at the Microsoft Reactor in Redmond. So great to have you here, Rich Princess. Absolutely fantastic to have you with us. Um, so cool. So let's let's talk about soil moisture. Why do we care about soil moisture? Okay, what is water even used for? Uh, so plants require water to grow. Fairly basic, I think it's something that we all know. But water is needed for three different things. So first of all, it's needed for photosynthesis. To actually absorb, um, yeah, to, to, to grow the plant, you need essentially complex carbohydrates. And they are made by water plus carbon dioxide plus sunlight. That gives you a complex carbohydrates that build the plant. But a lot of folks learn this in school, but it's one of the ingredients of photosynthesis. Water is also the blood, as it were, of a plant. So water can carry nutrients around. So that inside the plant, you have tubes that carry water around the plant. So it's part, it's part of the blood system is based off water. That's how it gets nutrients around the plant. And water also keeps the cells rigid. So plant cells, they supposed to have like a square structure or rectangular structure that's solid. And the, the reason they're kept solid is because they're full of water. When there's no water, the cells shrink and it goes droopy. You may have seen this. You've seen a plant that's not been watered and it's all floppy. And then you water it, pops back up again. So water is fundamentally important. It's absorbed in through the roots, goes up through the plant, and then use photosynthesis. Now, water, you have to have the right amount of water for the plant. Too little water, and there's not enough water for photosynthesis to carry the nutrients, keep, keep the plant rigid, and it dies. Too much water, and too much water gets absorbed, it can't, the plant can't, can't grow properly, you end up with the root rot and the plant dies. So you can't just keep piling on the water, you have to have the right amount of water. And that water varies from plant to plant to plant. So this is why it's fundamentally vital for farmers to water their plants correctly. They need to have not too much, not too little. Yeah, a little bit Goldilocks here. They've got to have that just right amount of water. Otherwise, the crops are going to suffer. Some crops do well in wet environments. Rice, for example, the rice fields, they have so much water, you get fish swimming amongst the rice. Yeah, that, that's fine with it. A lot of other plants don't. Uh, so where I live in the Pacific Northwest, our gardens have been terrible. We had way too much rain to start with. All the plants died. And then we had heat waves. And then there's no water and all the plants died. So, uh, you know, you need to have the right amount of water. And so the, the way you can measure it is actually using soil moisture sensors. So there are IoT devices, sensors that can measure soil moisture. And they come in two different types. So the first one is a resistive sensor. And you may have even built similar versions of these at school. Essentially, you have two metal probes that are connected to power. And then you put them in soil. And then some of the current goes from one probe through the soil to the other. And then depending on how much moisture there is in the soil, that determines how much water, uh, sorry, how much electricity can go from one probe to the other. And so it measures the resistance of the soil. And that's one way to get soil moisture. And what's really cool about a resistive sensor is you just need two bits of metal. You can literally build one using two nails and crocodile clips. As long as the nails are separated, and I built one using some Lego bricks to keep the nails apart, taped up the gaffer tape, attached to crocodile clips to it, and that's a soil moisture sensor. Anything you can do is just literally just stick two wires in the ground, and you can use that to measure soil moisture, which is pretty cool. The other option is a capacitive sensor. <coughs> oh, excuse me. 
So a capacitive sensor measures the ability to store charge between two plates. So this uses the, the, the moisture levels and the nutrient levels in the soil to store an amount of charge, and that charge is converted to a voltage. And so the wetter the soil, the more charge gets stored, the lower the voltage. And what's the big advantage of these capacitive sensors is they are, I don't know if you can see on the picture here, it says corrosion resistant, is they are corrosion resistant. If you have two bits of metal in wet soil, they can rust. You have capacitive plates, they don't rust. So they are corrosion resistant. They last a lot longer. So those are the two different types of soil moisture sensors. We're going to focus today on the capacitive moisture so, um, sensor rather than the resistive one. So let's actually have a look. Let's get one going. Let's get a sensor connected and let's actually get data coming through. And then we'll talk a bit more about sensor connectivity and sensor calibration. Kind of dive into the, the, the business stuff you need to know to be successful with IoT. So first of all, let's go to my camera here. So I'm using Raspberry Pi. If you're here for the last series, we did everything using the Raspberry Pi. So that's what I'm using today. A Raspberry Pi is my IoT device. And this has got the Grove Sense hat that we put on in the last series. And these got these standard connectors on here for plugging in the Grove sensors. This is the Seed Grove ecosystem. The idea being you take a standard cable, a standard plug, and you can connect your sensor onto the board. There's different sockets on here for different things but essentially you just plug in one cable and everything's built in here. So if you use like an LED, for example, it's got a resistor in it already, so you don't end up burning out the LED. If you've ever done any, you know, use, use a breadboard to connect an LED to GPIO pins directly, you need the resistor or you burn the LED. The growth sensors have that all built in. So I'm gonna take this up and it's literally, plug that in there. And then I plug it into one of the sockets on here. Which socket is it? It's this one here. Now, you really should turn your Raspberry Pi off before you plug it in, um, but I, I'm i lazy, so I didn't turn mine off. Um, but that plugs in, and that is our soil moisture sensor. So you see we have this white line here. This is the don't put the, the soil moisture any higher than here line. Um, this isn't a sealed unit, so you can actually see some of the, the components of the sensor up here. And so these can obviously, if you get wet, these can start corroding. Uh, in a professional environment, you actually get these as like a sealed unit with the stick coming out the bottom. And so it's actually a proper sealed, waterproof uh, unit. I've got some soil. Nice dry. This is nice and dry soil. Uh, no plant in it, because if I had a plant in there, you wouldn't be able to see anything. There'd be a plant in the way. Uh, it's got soil, and I just push my soil moisture sensor in there. And you see, I'm going to go and make sure I go in. Let's fuck down a bit. Below. So if you can see that, I'm going below the line. So that's my setup. And this is literally what you'd have in a commercial farm, just not in a jar. It would be a big industrial sensor, multiple sensors plugged in, and they'll probably communicate over some kind of wireless communication protocol because they're all around, all around your farm. So you plug that in, and then we can start writing some code. So again, if you're here last time, we're using Visual Studio Code for this. I'm running Visual Studio Code locally on my Mac, and I'm connecting using the remote SSH extension to my Raspberry Pi. So I am remotely connected to the Pi. I'm writing code here as if I was running on my Pi. I'm just running it on my Mac. Everything's connected to over SSH. This is my Pi's terminal. I can open folders on my Pi, and when I debug, it runs everything on the Pi. Really, really cool. So I'm just going to make a directory called soil... Uh, Moisture sensor, and then let's actually open that. So here I am, home slash pi. So moisture sensor. Sorry. Okay, and then let's add a new file. This is a Python file that we're going to use. So we're using Raspberry Pi. We're programming this using Python. Now I'm lazy. I'm just going to steal the code from the actual lesson itself. So with all our lessons, all the code is available to you. So if I go to the farming lesson, it's text soil moisture, and then I go to the right bit of code for actually doing this, you'll see we actually have all the instructions in the in Native Beginners to show you how to connect and program. So here it is, connected up, in you go, and then you write code. 
So I'm just going to copy and paste this code here, and I'll talk about it as I copy and paste it. So the first thing we're doing, we're importing time, so we can put a time loop, not interesting, but we're importing the Grove ADC, an analog to digital converter. And we'll dive into these in a little bit, but essentially this is converts an analog signal to a digital signal. We then create our analog to digital converter, create an instance of that, and then an infinite loop here that reads from the analog digital converter on channel zero. Now, when I plugged in, you want, I doubt you better see it very well. When I plugged it in, I if you can make that out, that says A0. So I, pl I plugged my cable into an analog port numbered zero. So A0, that's what I'm plugged into. And so we're just saying to the ADC, the analog digital converter, that we need the soil moisture value from port zero. And then we print this out and then we sleep for 10 seconds. Um, oh, Ben says, hey, Jim, this looks awesome. Can you have a sensor into each software hat? Is there a maximum distance for those wires? Wonder if I can trap all the plants in my conservatory from a single pie. Great question. Great question. So, yes, you can use all of these, but not for soil moisture sensors. Okay. So what you've got on the hat here is you have different types of sensors, different types of inputs. So we've got, if I bring it a bit closer, we have four analog inputs. We then have six digital, one pulse width modulation, one UART, and three I squared C. Now, don't worry about, about the terminology for this. I will be going into all these different things later. But essentially, the soil moisture plugs into the analog port. So there's only four sockets on here for that. But you can buy extender boards. You can buy a load more Grove boards. So what you'd need to do is, um, rather, rather than buy this hat, you can buy extender boards with more Grove ports. So you need to... So if you go on the Seed, Seed Studio website, you'll find they have all the different extender boards. And then, yes, you just buy a whole load of these soil moisture sensors. Now, in terms of the, of the wire distance, I've not actually tried. Um, but these are very simple, basic wires that send a very simple signal. So this is not like an HDMI signal where it's going to need repeaters if you go more than 10 meters. So these are just standard wires. I don't know if, I don't know if they make these wires very long. Um, that's something you have to check on the Seed Studio website. But you could, in theory, cut the wire and then just put your own wires in. And I imagine it will probably work over quite a long distance quite successfully. Um, so, yeah, try it and see. Um, and then if you're interested, get back in touch. I'd love to, um, if you build your conservatory, I would love to actually feature that on a show. If you can put all the plants in your conservatory, I'd, I'd love to do a show with you, actually show off what you've built. That'd be awesome. Um, but yeah, so I don't know of a maximum distance. Um, it's a great question, but yeah, because it's just, it's not sending high, high speed data. Yeah. With like things like HDMI, you know, where it's sending like 4k data is a lot of data. You get those limits. Whereas this is just literally, it's running at, you know, a few hundred bits, bits a second, if that, not even that. So yeah, long wires sh should be fine. it will be, be an interesting experiment. But yeah, so yeah, if you get a hold of, just get some different, diff the different connect, uh, extender boards for more analog ports and then have as many as you need. Mm. If not, you can get wireless soil moisture sensors, but they do cost a lot more. These ones are like a few a few dollars, uh, whereas you get the, the wireless ones that they use in industrial farms. They are very expensive, but that's, they last forever. So yes, please, 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 Ben, give it a go. Let me know how it goes. Um, Dukasoft says, oh, that's a hat. I was wondering why the pie looks strange. Yes. Yep. So this is the Grove base hat from Seed Studio. So this is, so Seed sell this, this whole Grove ecosystem. I and mean, even their, their Wii terminal, their Arduino device has Grove sockets on the back. Um, and the idea is you just plug this hat onto the pins and you can plug in any of their sensors into the relevant slot and you just drop the cable in. So it's absolutely fantastic. Um, Adrian Clint says, I think the longest cable they do is 50 centimeters. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Yeah, so I can't imagine seeds do really long cables. So you'd have to make one yourself. Um, but you could literally just splice this cable and put cables in. It'd be an interesting experiment. Uh, these cables come in packs of lots for not very much money. So if you have a spare one, splice it and just um, run the cables. Let's try it. Interesting, interesting, interesting experiment. Yeah, I'd love to hear about it. So please, 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 Ben, if you do this, get in touch. Cool. So if we actually run, if we run this now, what this is doing 
is this is every 10 seconds, it is reading a value from the analog digital converter from our soil moisture sensor. And so that's just reading a value based off how wet the soil is. And you'll see it's currently around 579575 something. What that value is, we don't know. We'll start looking at it later on. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a trusty glass of water out of my jar. And I'm going to try not to spill water everywhere and toast my pie. So, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, I, was, I was topping this up earlier and I spilled water. I actually was doing it from a jug with a lip and it spilled everywhere. So let's try it with a glass and try not to spill. So chuck some water in there. Just make sure it's a better one. So that water's kind of soaked in. And now if I look here, you'll see we're now 417. So the number's going down, 395. So the, the, the number, whatever this number is, which we'll look at in a minute, whatever this number is, it is now going down as the soil gets wet. There you go, 388. So we've gone down from 579 to 388. So we've seen there is a difference. We've seen the sensor working. So we'll just leave that running. And while we leave that running, let's actually talk a little bit about how the sensor actually communicates. I mentioned that on the Grove hat, we've got I squared C ports and UART ports, um, GPIO pins. What does all this mean? So let's actually dig into some of the theory behind how sensors communicate with our IoT devices. So the first thing to look at is GPIO, General Purpose Input Output. And these are standard hardware pins. So many different devices have GPIO pins. They are pins that all IoT dev kits have. And the idea is you can connect these two things. And usually on your hardware, you will have an analog to digital converter or a digital to analog converter. Um, and these, these pins you, you will either run at 3.3 volts or 5 volts. You have ground pins and you have programmable pins. And so the idea is if I, if I actually show you some GPIO pins, something out of the way. So these pins along here, if I turn it upright, you might see these are actual pins. These are GPIO pins, general purpose input output pins. And some of these pins are ground. So they have zero volts. Some are 3.3 volts, some are five volts. So you can build up a, a circle, a circle, a circuit between, between them. And then there's a whole load of programmable pins. So they're pins you can say, I want this to send a signal, I want this to receive a signal. So for example, if you wanted to send a signal to something, you would program a pin to be output, connect that output pin to ground, and then if you send a signal, it makes that circuit to allow you to send voltage to things. So these pins can be kind of programmed for whatever you need, hence their name, general purpose input output. And usually you'd have one device per set of pins. So if you've got a couple of pins, you put one device on there, you can have more using other communication protocols. So the other communication protocols we'll talk about in a minute can run over GPIO. GPIO is just literally the hardware that you can use. Um, oh, Duck Chickens says, whoa, this is great. I'm a bit late to the stream. We need to catch up. We are considering soil moisture sensors at work. Oh, awesome. Yeah, this stream is recorded. So everything will be available for you to watch um, within about a day or two on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. But yes, so, but today we're doing soil moisture sensors. Uh, next week, we're looking at controlling relays to power water pumps. Um, to get you to manage watering. And then we're looking at migrating that to uh, cloud control. So yes, that's awesome. Um, and Abadus says, howdy all. Hey Abadus, glad to have you here. Cool. So GPIO, if we look at like a simple GPIO pin, a digital pin. Okay, so you can have pins set as digital or analog. Digital, one and zero. Analog is a various, a varied signal. Um, so digital pin can be, can it be set to on or off? And you have as input or output. So an input pin, you would have, uh, you would connect the, a voltage pin to an input pin to make a circuit through maybe something like a button. And when the button is down, the voltage is made from five volts to the input pin. And you can read a value from the input pin. And it says one, the input pin is on. The button is released. There's no circuit made. The value of the input pin is zero. It's off. Now, it's not quite exactly zero volts and five volts. It does a kind of a halfway house. So anything above half the expected voltage is on, anything below is off. So if you give four volts, it's on. 
one volt is off. Output pins are kind of similar, but you, you control the voltage going to the output pin. So you can say, I want this output pin on or this output pin off. And if it's on, it sends whatever the voltage is. If it's off, it sends nothing. So like with the LED, for example, you plug LED to output pins, set it to one, sends electricity through the output pin, three LED, back to ground, and it lights up. So it's kind of very, digital pins look very simple. Either send all the voltage or no vol voltage. Receive all the voltage or no voltage. You can also have analog pins as well. So analog pins are where you don't have a one or zero number. You actually have a varied signal. And in the last series of this, we looked at a light sensor, and that was another analog sensor. And so it, voltage goes out, and you get some of the voltage back. And the amount of voltage you get back determines the value that you get. So you could send out 3.3 volts, and then you might get back you know, 1.65 volts, so half the signal. And that is then converted to a numerical value on the device. Because IoT devices are digital devices. Computers are digital. They, do, they don't work with analog numbers. You have to convert that to a digital signal. So you use an analog digital converter or digital analog converter. So for example, if I'm doing um, an input pin, I'm reading a light value, then I will send voltage, I'll get voltage back, and the analog to digital converter converts that voltage to usually a 10-bit number. So it's a number from 0 to 1,023. I'm sure there's a good reason why it's 10-bit, and I've never found out why. But it's usually a 10-bit number. Same with output pins. If you want to send a voltage, you want to have like a, a light that you're controlling the brightness. You send a digital signal. A digital to analog converter converts from that 10-bit number to a voltage, and you get that voltage. So you send 511. The, the DAC, digital analog converter, converts at 1.65 volts, and it sends that voltage through. So that's how it kind of handles digital and analog. Um, Krilly Middle says, hey, from Uppsala, Sweden. Jim, great stream. Great to have you here. Welcome. Welcome from Sweden. Awesome. It's one thing I, I love about doing streams in US morning is I get all, all my European friends can join because you know, no one's at work because it's the evenings. So uh, glad to have folks from all around the world here. In fact, that's your question for everyone on the stream. Can you just drop in the chat where in the world you are? Love to find out where you're all from. Um, that'd be really cool. So yeah, if, if you don't mind, just drop in the chat where, where in the world you are. That'd be cool. Fuel Snables from Scandinavia. So two from Scandinavia. Nice. It's a random fact. Uh, my daughter's new teacher at school that actually did um, trained in Norway and the Scandinavian education system is supposed to be fantastic. So I'm very excited um, that she's never a teacher who was trained in Scandinavia. So Ben is from Chippenham, the UK. Nice. Duke soft in Denmark. So more Scandinavia. Adrian is London. Furious Tigers in Seattle. Um, in my local stomping ground. Um, Fuel Snail says we might be working, but but the boss has gone home. <laughs> the boss has gone home. Go home. So that's what evenings are for. Uh, Gulliver's in Redwood City, California. Leandro's in Sao Paulo. Uh, Anuruddha is in India. And Abadis is in Canada. Representation from all around the world. Great to have you here. Um, Anand's in India as well. Uh, it's practically tomorrow in India, isn't it? So uh, great to have you here. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, duck chickens in the UK. So we've got some Scandinavia, got some UK, got some India, got some US, Canada, Brazil. Nice, nice. No, thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, cool. Okay, so let's talk about I squared C. So inter-integrated circuit. It's a bit of a mouthful, hence it's known as I squared C. So I squared C is a communication protocol that you can use across GPIO pins or kind of whatever pins you have on your device. And the idea, it's a multi-controller, multi-peripheral protocol. Okay. What that means is you can have, you have, you have a, essentially a bus which is where all the device is connected to. And then any device on the bus can be a controller or it can be a peripheral. So a controller is the one that says, send me data or here's some data, and a peripheral can I listen. The controller can be your IoT device. The peripheral can be a sensor. Now, this used to be referred to as master and slave rather than controller and peripheral. And so we are, there is general push to get away from that terminology for obvious reasons, uh, but you will still see it referred to as master and slave sometimes. You still refer to it as like multi-master, multi-slave protocol. So just be aware if you see master and slave, master is controller, slave is peripheral, but we don't use that language anymore. And then oh, oh, Ramal as well, Ramal's in India as well. Cool, awesome. So yeah, great to see some 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 uh, Indian friends joining us. No, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, so data sends address packets. So every device on the I squared C bus has an address and data is sent to an address packet. You can kind of think of it like your Wi-Fi at home. I'm sending it, my, my network is sending a data packet to my iPhone or my laptop or what have you. Kind of like that. It's addressed packets. And so it's all based off four wires. So the whole bus has four wires. Um, so you have VCC and GND, that's basically voltage and ground. So that's power. Everything has power. You then have a clock wire and a data wire. And the idea is there's kind of a negotiation that happens between the, all the different devices. So one device will send a signal on one of the wires to say, I want to be the controller. I want to be in charge. And that device then becomes the controller. And as the controller, it can then say, here's the address of the device I want to talk to, and then send a request to that device to give it data or send data to that device. So yeah, my actual IoT device itself can act as a controller. It can say, I'm controller. I want to talk to my soil moisture sensor and I want to receive data. And the soil moisture sensor sends the data. And then once it's got the data, it says, I'm not a controller anymore. And that keeps on working like that. And you can have thousands of devices in theory connected as long as they all have different addresses so you can know which one to talk to. Now, this is not fast. Yeah. The Raspberry Pi has got a, a high-speed I squared C bus available over the GPIO pins that runs at a cracking 400 kilobits per second. Yeah, it's not fast. It's not designed for huge amounts of data. You don't send 4K HDMI over I squared C. It's just done so you can send small sensor values. And actually, the, the Grove device, all this Grove stuff here, although we have analog and digital ports and they act like analog and digital connections, under the hood, Grove actually uses I squared C. So that's where you can plug in any device and it works because each device is an I squared C device. Now, I squared C devices, they normally have their ID hard coded on the device. You can change it sometimes by breaking fuses. Um, sometimes you can flash firmware, but a lot of times it's hard coded on the device. So actually thinking about this, Ben, this might be an issue for you because the soil moisture sensors have um, have the same I squared C address. So I don't know if you put, I have not actually tried multiple on there. Well, that's maybe an interesting experiment. I have to try and put multiple on there and I'll report back next week. Um, but yeah, that's a, just have one of those interesting thoughts. Okay, anyway, <laughs> I'm distracting myself. So that's I squared C. Uh, it's quite a popular protocol for communicating between sensors, uh, but it's not very fast. Now, another one, another way of communicating is UART, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. And if you've ever connected to a serial port on an, on an IoT device, you know, if you've ever written Arduino code and you've done serial.begin and you've listened from your serial monitor, you are sent to using UART. UART is serial communication between two devices. Each device has a transmit pin and a receive pin, and then you connect transmit to receive and transmit to receive. So the idea is one transmits to the others receive, and it's just between two devices and two devices only. And that these devices have to agree upfront what speed. They have a thing called board rate, which is the speed at which they send bits of data. And what they do is they send a start bit, so one bit to say I'm starting, eight bits of data, and then one bit to say I'm stopping. And that's how they get synchronized by looking at the start and stop bits. And so you connect them up, they expect to listen at a certain speed, and they pull data. Only between two devices can be fast. You can get up to six and a half megabits per second. Um, and GPIO pins do work as UART as well. So on the GPIO pins on the Pi, they have pins you can use as UART, TX and RX pin. You'll see this in quite a lot of devices. There's TX and RX, connect to those, get data. Good for sending data, but only for between two, two devices. Um, if you get like GPS devices, for example, a lot of GPS are UART. Connect to it and it sends a stream of messages from GPS satellites over serial connection, over UART. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the next one we'll talk about is SPI. Oh, Ashika's joining as well, say from London. Welcome from London. So yeah, another one for the, for the UK contingent. Awesome. Glad to have you here, Ashika. Cool, so SPI is um, a, a, a kind of a much faster 
connection. And this is a single controller, multiple peripheral. So unlike I squared C, multiple controller, multiple peripheral, SPI has one controller with multiple peripherals that it can talk to. The controller is usually your IoT device, your, your Raspberry Pi, your Arduino device, your, yeah, your, mic your microcontroller, whatever. That's usually your controller. Now, again, the language is, it has improved. It used to be single master, multiple slave. And again, you'll still see that terminology referred to, but it's we're now called, referred to as single controller, multiple peripheral. Now, what's cool about SPIs is full duplex. So with I squared C, the controller would say, I'm in charge, give me data and get data. With SPI, you can send and receive at the same time. So the controller can talk to the peripherals, um, one peripheral at a time, because it can't talk to multiple peripherals at a time, one peripheral at a time, but data can go back and forth. So you can be requesting data, sending messages, getting data back, which is pretty cool. And in theory, there's no defined speed limits for SPI. And this is great if you want to use things like flash storage. So if you've got an IoT device, you're going to want to ha actually store on your device extra data. You might want to download a file off the internet and save it on the device for processing. You might want to capture a picture from a camera and save that on, on the device to then send up to the cloud. And so flash, things like flash storage usually work over SPI because it's fast. Yeah, not as fast as the SSDs on chips that you get inside your computer, but fast for an IoT device. Remember these IoT devices, they usually tick at you know, a few hundred megahertz in terms of their speed. So SPI is kind of, you, won't, you, know, you can't pull SPI data off a of gigahertz, but you can pull it off you know, usually fast enough for a low powered IoT device. And again, you can do SPI over GPIO pins, there's standard pins on a lot of the devices for doing this. And so the way it works is each peripheral has four wires, four connections, and your controller has three connections plus one per peripheral. So if you have one controller, one peripheral, it's four wires, one controller, two peripherals, your controller has five wires. And so you have your, what's called copy, which is controller out peripheral in, which is the wire used to send a signal from controller to a peripheral. And that connects to the copy, to the, the pin on all the peripherals. You then have Kippo, uh, not C3PO. I mean, as you can tell, I'm a Star Wars fan. Uh, this is CIPO. That's controller in peripheral out. And again, all the peripherals connect to one wire that connects to the controller. And that's data coming from peripherals. You then have the clock. What controller connects all the peripherals with the clock. And then you have a chip select wire and that's the one wire you have per peripheral and so the way it works is when the controller wants to talk to a peripheral it, you, it uses the chip select wire to say which peripheral it wants to talk to and so it sets a voltage on one of the wires and that tells one of the peripherals i'm talking to you and all the other other peripherals they're not getting a voltage so they just switch off and ignore the messages and then the controller can send messages to the peripheral over the copy wire or receive messages from the peripheral over the, the Kippo wire. And the other peripherals, if their, clock, if their chip select is not set, they ignore it. So a controller says, here's some data for you to save. Only the peripheral that's got the chip select wire on will save that data. And that's how it works. So it's, it's full, du full duplex to one peripheral and one peripheral only. Um, it's not full duplex to multiple peripherals. And so, yeah, obviously it does mean that your controller needs to have a lot of chip select wires if you have a lot of peripherals. And usually, but you don't. It's usually like, it's flash storage. It's kind of the, one of the big use cases for this. And so the, the, the clock wire, that keeps everything in sync. So that sets a signal to actually tell the peripherals the speed at which the data is coming. So unlike UART, which had the start and stop bits to align the data, the clock wire does that. So it can send, send data over. So yeah, so SPI, very fast, used in a, lo a lot of things. And then finally, we have wireless. I'm not going to dive into too much detail on this, but there's a lot of wireless communication that IoT devices do. And this is not just Wi-Fi. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Things like Bluetooth low energy. <clears throat> if you've got like a Fitbit or any kind of fitness tracker, they will communicate with your phone over Bluetooth. LoRa. LoRa is long range radio. This is kind of range of multiple miles, but very low speed. Great for farming. Yeah, you know, if you have a soil moisture sensor in a field somewhere, you don't want to have to run necessarily run a long wire from there. Yeah, you know, miles and miles and miles back to your farmhouse. You would then you actually communicate over LoRa. Zigbee as well. Zigbee is like a local Wi-Fi mesh network. Philips Hue lights use it. So one light sends a signal to another light to another light to the 
to the internet. So there's a whole different wireless protocols that you can use. I'm not really going to dive any more than that. Uh, Roman asked a question. For IT for beginners, which programming language you prefer the beginner is aware of? Great question. So when we built IT for beginners, <clears throat> we focused on two different types of hardware. So the two biggest hardware categories that um, new IT developers use is usually Arduino and Raspberry Pi. So Arduino is microcontroller based. You have a low power chip that you build the firmware for and you deploy that and your controller, your microcontroller just runs your firmware and nothing else. Arduino is the number one framework for that for beginners. And so if you want to go down the Arduino route, <clears throat> we support Arduino and that is C++. C, C++. So if you want to go down the Arduino route, you need to know C and C++. If you want to go down, down the microprocessor route, so Raspberry Pi is essentially a full featured Linux computer. I can plug this Pi into my monitor, keyboard, mouse, full out desktop operating system, code away on that. If you want to use that for it, uh, then that we, we program that in Python and IT for beginners. So it's Python with a Raspberry Pi or C++ with the Arduino, and you can choose the route you want to take. If you don't want to buy hardware, you want to go down the uh, the hard, virtual hardware simulator, that, it, that is Python. That simulates the hardware that we plugged into a Raspberry Pi. Now, in the kind of the professional world, if you are building professional IoT devices, a lot of them use C, C++, um, but a lot of them use frameworks that are relevant for the particular hardware provider. So if you buy hardware from ST Micro, they have their STM Cube environment for building hardware. You want to use expressive devices, ESP32 is in professional environments, they use expressive IDF. So Arduino is making its way into the professional space. We've got some new hardware that is professional grade, the Portenta boards, but they're still a hobbyist and enthusiast type setup. The, the reason I've gone for, <coughs> excuse me, Arduino and Raspberry Pi is because they are what a lot of students have and a lot of beginner folks actually use these. Raspberry Pis are using commercial environments. You can get the compute board, which plugs into, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. <coughs> get a Raspberry Pi compute board that plugs into um, a whole load of more advanced uh, IoT setups and they can run whatever code that your Pi can run. So they can run Python. So yeah, C++ and Python are kind of the two big ones. And it's your choice out of those two, which you want to use. But yeah, great, great question. Thank you, Ryan. Great question. <laughs> hey, so... Let's just talk a little bit about sensor values. We talked about how we get the data from a sensor. We looked into I squared C and UR and SPI and kind of how sensor values come in. But what do the actual numbers mean? Okay, so if I go back here to my code, we have a soil moisture of 388, 387. 387 watts. Is this 387 degrees Celsius? Is this 387 kilopascals? Is it 387 giraffes? You know, it's a 387 football fields. What do these numbers actually mean? And this is why data scientists, the main experts, are your friend when it comes to being an IoT engineer. Now, some sensors will actually send you data in useful values. Um, oh, Ayushama says 387 coconuts. Yes, you're using coconuts. Um, sorry, that's a Monty Python joke for any... British folks who know that one. Yes, 387 coconuts. Yep, that's the answer. Stream over. No. <laughs> no. Um, so with some sensors, they do come actually sending you the right data. So if you get like a temperature sensor, it will send you the temperature in usually degrees Celsius. And then you can convert that to Fahrenheit, Kelvin, if you want to. Usually, But it's usually pre-calibrated and sends you the data as degrees Celsius. Uh, whereas what we got here, we got 383 coconuts. You know, what... What, what does this all mean? How does it matter or anything? And this is where when you start thinking about sensor calibration. Okay. Now, sensors don't detect degrees Celsius or coconuts or kilopascals for pressure. Sensors detect electrical signals. So they detect things like resistance, voltage, capacitance. A you know, temperature sensor will usually detect resistance. The resistance is measured in ohms. So you've got a temperature sensor and it's sending you 22.5 kilo ohms. What, what, what is that? You don't, we don't measure temperature in, in kilo ohms. Uh, so we need temperature in degrees Celsius. So the idea is sensors usually get calibrated 
usually at, in the factory, to convert from electrical units to known units where there is a known unit. So the temperature sensor, for example, someone will build the sensor and they will put that in a number of well-defined temperatures. They'll put it at zero degrees and 10 degrees and 20 degrees and 30 degrees. And they will use that to build a calculation that would run on a chip, a tiny little chip on the temperature sensor to convert the electrical signal to degrees Celsius. So you would read a value, usually have a digital signal that encodes the value that gives you the degree Celsius. And that is set in the factory. And sometimes it's a simple one-to-one -one relationship, as in this resistance is this, this resistance is this, draw a straight line, that's your number. Sometimes it's a more complex, complex calculation. But it's, a lot of these are calibrated in the factory. And that's for the sensors that have known units. So a temperature sensor will give you Celsius. Pressure sensor will give you kilopascals. But some sensors, there, are, there is no known unit. And sometimes that known unit is impossible to get. And that's something you'll find with soil moisture sensors. So this is kind of one of the, the problems of soil moisture is there are well-known, there are units of soil moisture, but there is no simple mapping from the unit to soil moisture. You know, we're reading an analog signal. We get a value of zero between 2023. What does that mean? So there's two kind of options here. One is we don't care what the number actually means. We just know what the number is we like. So if you're like a, I don't know, if you're like Ben with uh, with their conservatory, if you know by feel that, yep, yeah, yeah, stick my finger in the soil, this soil is the right moisture, I can stick my soil moisture sensor in there, go, yep, that is 560 is my ideal soil moisture. And if it goes below that, so the, number, so the number goes above that, I need to add water because water brings the number down. Yes, yeah, so if it goes up to like 600, I add water. If it goes below that, I've got too much water. So maybe that's all you need. But if you do care, then what you can do is you can actually calibrate your soil moisture sensor based off your soil by doing lab measurements of actual water levels. So there is no, it's not, there is no, the, the way soil moisture is measured is either from gravimetric analysis or volumetric analysis. So the idea is you take your soil, you say, I've got, you know, this is a, I've got like 10 kilos of soil. You then heat it in an oven, drive off all the water. How much is my soil weigh? And your gravimetric analysis is the weight of water per weight of soil. So you could say, right, I've taken a block of soil, 10 kilos of soil from my farm. This soil, when I measure it with my soil moisture sensor is 380. And then when I put it in the lab, it says I've got for every four kilos of soil, I've got six kilos of water. And then you can use that as your calibration. And you kind of know how much water per weight of soil that you want. You've got your kind of target gravimetric measure. I want to have you know, seven kilos of water per three kilos of soil. Therefore, I need to work out what my measurement is. So or you can do volumetric, volume of water per volume of soil. I've got you know, cubic meter of soil. That contains, you know, when I dry that down, that had cubic meter of water in it, for example. So there's different ways to measure. And what you would then, what you would do is you would measure the soil moisture, send it with your soil moisture sensor, send it to the lab and kind of rinse and repeat a few times. And then you build up a chart of, for this soil moisture, this is my signal. This soil moisture, this is my signal. And get that kind of line. And then from that line, you can then, calibrate your soil moisture sensor and you can take a reading so you know what soil moisture content you want in um kilos per kilo of soil or you know cubic meters in per cubic meter of soil kind of whatever you know what you want and you can use that to get the voltage level that you want to actually get from your soil moisture sensor so it's kind of a bit more complicated it's not um yeah it's not just a simple yes my soil moisture sensor gives me an accurate number that I can use. So this is why I keep saying you need to have somebody who understands the domain and understands the data when you do this. Because if I'm capturing this data from around my farm, I have to know what that number means. Now, different fields can have different values because the, the, this, the soil moisture sensor is reading a capacitance. And that's not just impacted by the amount of water in the soil, it's also impacted by the constituents of the soil. So if you have like a high clay soil, you'll get a different reading for a known value of water than you would in a low clay soil. And so you don't not, so not only do you have to calibrate on a per farm basis, but sometimes even on a per field basis. Of course, this leads to a lot of ideas that are happening at the moment around data sharing. And so if all farms report, 
this is my, my type of soil and this is my ideal soil moisture measurement, they can use that to kind of build up a picture of where in the world, you know, what kind of soil moisture levels you want in different parts of the world. So there's kind of a lot of data sharing going on to get to get this, to, to make it easier, but still you need to really, on a almost field by field basis, actually send it to a lab to calibrate this. So Furious Tiger asks, why don't companies create sensors that communicate real units by default? Is it because it's downstream interpretation that requires software? Um, so great question, absolutely great question. So some sensors do communicate real units by default. Some sensors do. Um, where there are real units that can be communicated. So a temperature sensor will send you temperature. Uh, that has to be implemented in software because the way you measure temperature is using a what's called a thermistor. So it's a, it's a, a piece of metal that essentially its resistance changes as temperature changes. And so something's got to convert that resistance to a value. And that does happen on a lot of, lot of temperature sensors. So if I get the Grove temperature sensor, for example, um, it's actually combined <clears throat> temperature, pressure, humidity. If I plug that in, the signal I get from the sensor is it is 24 degrees Celsius. It's 980 kilopascals of pressure. And we're at 45% humidity, for example. So that does give real units because those real units are known and established. Things like a light sensor can be different. You can get accurate light sensors that will read in candelas or lumens. And actually, again, the, it's a resistor that the resistance is changed by light. And so something somewhere, there's got to be software that converts that resistance level into a light level. And that usually happens on the sensor. Um, and then you can then use that in your code. The one I, I used in the last series of this, the light sensor there, doesn't give you real units because it's not designed to be that, that accurate. It's just designed for things like, are my lights on or off? In which case I don't need a more expensive sensor that does that, that calibration. With soil moisture, there is no way of doing this. You literally cannot convert it to real units because the real units do not map to what you measure because of the soil. Because a reading of 530 could mean one level of water in a clay soil different level of water in a low place soil. It just is literally impossible, which is why you have to use a lab to calibrate, which is why a lot of farmers are looking to share data to make this easier. Um, but yeah, so some sensors just, you can't, you can't do that. Motion sensors, you can, if you're detecting acceleration, it can measure acceleration in meters per second um, in different directions. You can have gyroscopes that can measure up, down, left, right. GPS sensors will give you the, your actual location. Uh, so some sensors can do it. Great, great question though, but yeah, some sensors can't. So if you're measuring um, temperature in or, or occupancy, occupancy sensor, you've got, you've got a sensor um, that just measures, is there a person in a room? Yeah, on or off, one or zero, is there a person? Works perfectly for that. Um, but if you wanted to work out, let's just say anything more advanced where it's how many people are in the room? You know, it's kind of harder to do. So, yeah, great, great question. Great question. Um, a lot of what we think is kind of would be obvious with IoT devices is available. So there's a lot of sensors for checking things that are just completely available. But some things are just, just can't be done. Just can't be done. So great question. Great question. Awesome. Cool. So that kind of wraps up the first session today. We've looked at soil moisture sensors. Uh, we actually looked at the hardware for one. We've got one in some soil, we've seen the value change. And then we looked at what does it mean? How does it communicate with the IoT device? How do we get data around between controllers and peripherals? And then we looked at the actual value we've got here. What does 387 mean? And as we established it, 387 coconuts. Um, but now we kind of talked a bit about sensor calibration and just how important that is. Uh, so that wraps up today's stream. Next week, same time, I'll be back and I'll be looking at automating plant watering. So actually, how do we control a pump from our IoT device based off our soil moisture sensor? So if our soil moisture is too low, how do we automatically add water? And so we're diving into that and talking more about why you need to be the main expert, because you can't just add water from checks straight away. There's kind of time issues about water moved through soil and all kind of cool things like that. Uh, so if you haven't registered for that, the same place you registered for this one, if you did it on the uh, Microsoft Reactor site um, or a meetup you can register if not go to aka.ms slash iot dash beginners dash project two for the registration site you can register for next week's session um so with that thank you very much everyone for joining us from all around the world thank you for sharing where you are great to have so many folks from just everywhere so thanks for joining and i'll see you all next week
Thank you, everyone, and thank you to our speaker. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Link, link to our survey can be found on the screen as well as in the chat. For this specific event, it's 16970. And as Jim mentioned, he will be back next week um, with episode two. We'd love to see you all there. The, see, uh, the link can be found in the chat and on the screen as well. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a great one. Until next time. Thanks. Bye, everyone.